morning, everyone. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Digital Data Podcast. I'm Cecilia Maundu. I'm a broadcast journalist and I'm a digital security trainer. I work at the intersection of technology, human rights, and journalism. And today, we, it's an exciting episode because we are continuing with our data detox storytelling um, series. This episode has been made possible by an organization, an organization called Tactical Tech. Tactical Tech is based in Berlin. Is an NGO that engages with citizen and civil society organizations to explore and mitigate the impact of technology on society. And today we are talking about a very thorny issue, disinformation and misinformation. And I have an all-female panelist. Yay. So I'm going to introduce my guests or I'm going to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. Yes. Welcome to Digital Dada. Thanks, Cecilia. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you for having me. My name is Neri Mawako, and I'm the executive director of Siasa Place, and Siasa means politics. And so we push for the inclusion of young people in political processes. And so because I work with young people, we work on all social media platforms, and we utilize them for advocacy and also for pushing for our rights and also learning about the constitution. Nerima, thank you so much for gracing Digital Dada. It was about time. Yeah. I've been looking for Nerima for the last one year. So you can tell she's a very okay. busy CEO. Not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and my second guest, she's international, by the way. Uh, thank you very much, Cecilia, for having me. Uh, my name is Mampi Losmanje, and I am the Africa Advocacy and Partnerships Lead at the International Press Institute. We are a global network of journalists, editors, and publishers based in Vienna, uh, but I work in the region based in Zimbabwe, and I um, do work particularly at the intersection of human rights, technology, and the law, uh, but mainly uh, promoting access to information, free expression and media freedom, and also the right to privacy, both online and offline. Thank you. Thank you, Nompilo, for making time to fly all the way from Zim to be our guest. Yes, that's what she did. Anyway, so as I said, it's a storytelling series. And um, Nerima, yeah. I just want you to tell me what is one misinformation story that, um, mm -hmm. especially during the election, that you had that you almost became a victim and then you realize, oh, oops, no, it's misinformation. <laughs> so uh, this last election, 2022, was a bit different for me. A lot of my work is around politics and election work. But in 2022, my husband was vying for member of parliament. So there were a lot, a lot of rumors um, about him, about us, about me, about my child. Um, but then I think that there's a time when there's a Facebook group uh, for his constituency, which has like 20,000 members. And so I was a member of it so I could see what people were talking about. Uh, and so he's not a member of it. And so he was like, why are you in there? And I'm like, I need to know uh, what people are saying. So there was a time that um, there was a rumor that one, he had left the party and basically talking about how he had been bought. And then there were also rumors about me and us actually separating and not being together and, and him going into the community and going with another wife. And so it was interesting uh, because you would see the kind of bloggers that were in this election. So there were a lot more bloggers online on these Facebook groups spreading a lot of lies about particular candidates. And we were a victim of that. But it also took a lot of being brave about some of the things people would say about you and they don't even know you but the worst one was or logging on and seeing a video of my husband actually being beaten by police officers um, on election day during tallying so that was not misinformation um, it really happened but the story was that he had come into the tallying center illegally and stopped the counting process but really technically what happened was that he was locked out from the station itself. So they were actually pulling him out instead of allowing him to be in. And so they changed the narrative and said he was forcing to get in. There. Wow. <clears throat> um, just um, to build on that, 
like um, uh, this, the kit we are talking about, data detox kit, gives a perspective of a holistic security. So, psych, um, psychosocially, how was it for you? It was tough. Um, it was tough. At some point, you're uh, wondering if you should see a therapist. Uh, luckily, on my team, we did have one because we had partnered with Oasis Africa, uh, who had doctors on call. And so they were supporting my team and some of the young women who were vying for elective seats. And so that also helped a lot. Thank you, Nerima. And um, let me apologize on behalf of my fellow Kenyans. <clears throat> so, Nompilo. Tell us a story that you almost fell victim. You people are going into an election in August, so I can imagine the temperatures are very high. That is if your election is like the Kenyan election where we are always on the age when we are about to get into an election. So tell us what's been happening, especially on the social media platforms. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Cecilia. I mean, I don't have spicy stories to tell like Nerima. <laughs> uh, but I mean, um, there have been so many cases actually of, um, you know, disinformation in Zimbabwe, which I would want to share. Um, you know, we had our last election in 2018, and you see some articles online that spoke of online vicious propaganda wars in Zimbabwe, basically highlighting uh, the nature of the toxicity and the disinformation um, that was there um, in that time. And now, uh, you know, we, like you said, we have an election coming on the 23rd of August. And uh, it's actually also have been quite, uh, the information ecosystem has also been marred uh, with lots of disinformation. Uh, but maybe picking from the last election, some examples that I would give uh, would be gendered disinformation that we saw, which is also still there uh, even right now in the current uh, and upcoming election. So we have one of the um, female politicians who, who also has their own political party and uh, there were stories about how, you know, she had an abortion. There were so many stories also of disinformation around the paternity of her children. Um, and also, you know, there were some other stories also relating even to our electoral uh, commission where there were pictures circulating of a false ballot. And then people in the rural communities were also being told uh, by one of the political parties that will be watching you. We actually have the capacity to watch you and we'll see where you put your ex on the ballot. So so, um, you know, th there's always this disinformation that was going around then, but which we've also seen now. Some of it also has been state-sponsored disinformation, where you see, for example, a picture of a road uh, that is being, you know, constructed in Nigeria, and then you are told that, you know, the government is constructing this road. Uh, this government has really put in some work in infrastructure development, um, and, you know, you need to vote in um, this, this government back into power in 2023. So, yeah, we, we did have have our own fair share um, of disinformation as well, state sponsored, gendered, um, and sometimes also uh, quite targeted at specific individuals and, and journalists included. Thank you so much, Nompilo. You bring in a very interesting perspective, gendered um, disinformation, which I'll come to. But now, uh, as we get into the agenda of the day, uh, can one of you just define what is misinformation and disinformation? Because there's a lot of confusion about those two words. Yes. So basically how I understand it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, when I think of misinformation, sometimes it can just be an individual like myself uh, sharing information that is false, not necessarily always knowing that it's false. Um, but then disinformation is when it's a higher entity, a bigger entity that has more of a reach. So that also falls under government, where government is intentionally sharing false information using their platforms to do so, to change an narrative for the public. That's the way I understand it. Okay. Nompila, do you have anything to add on that uh, front? Um, yeah, just to agree with Nerima that, you know, misinformation, it's normally when you believe something to be true. Um, I know one example in Zimbabwe where we had our marriages bill that was being um, amended or that was being introduced. And then one day we woke up to a headline that Lobola, Aurora or Bride Price um, is no longer a requirement. Uh, that was just misinformation. That was um, a misinterpretation of the law and what the law was saying. Uh, but disinformation is deliberate, uh, misleading um, and false information. Um, so that it, that aspect around intention and a need to mislead is what would define disinformation for me. Yeah. 
Okay, um, Nerima, what um, what uh, impact does the disinformation and misinformation have when it comes to the issue of voting patterns? Knowing mm -hmm. that Siasa Place has been on the ground, especially during the election, has been there um, advocating for different issues. What does it have? What impact does it have? And especially also when it comes to the choices of the candidate, especially if it is male and female. It has a lot of impact and effect because if you look at even the kind of information that's shared on voting day, for instance, if people share information about, oh, there's uh, security concerns, there's violence at this polling station, and it's false, it will actually change the number of people who come out to vote, specifically women, because women want to be able to feel safe uh, when they vote. So if they see that there's a bit of a fracas, a lot of them are not going to vote. And so I can even give an example of when we saw an occurrence of intentional uh, disinformation or misleading. And that happened in Nakuru County, where there was a lady, she was vying for women representative, and she was leading, she was doing really well. And the opponent uh, basically sent or paid people to go to the different schools, the polling stations. And so while they're walking in, just basically saying, oh, do you know so-and-so is not on their ballot paper? She decided to resign, so she's not on their ballot paper, so uh, who am I going to vote for? I think I'm just going to go home. So a lot of her people ended up going home and not voting for her. So that was intentional and misleading. And she ended up losing the vote on that particular day. So it does happen. And we've seen major disinformation mainly in Kenya, not during an election season. I think the biggest one would be with the Huduma number when we saw the government coming out and saying, if you do not take this card, if you do not register for this number, you're not going to have access to government services. And we remember our government spent up to 10 billion shillings to force people to line up and to register for this particular document that today we don't even use. Uh, we, we've completely dismissed it and it's been a one huge scandal and scam where government has spent money and we can't account for it. And that's also disinformation because government has no right to take away any individual citizen's right. They have no right. Yes, Huduma number was such a big, big scam. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Nompilo, as, as a journalist, what do you think is the role of um, especially mainstream media when it comes to combating disinformation and misinformation? Because unfortunately, I don't know how the case is in uh, Zim, sometime also the mainstream media has been involved in it. So what is their role? Um, yeah, thank you so much. I mean, uh, I I come from a legal background, but having worked a lot with, with journalists, I do appreciate how the media landscape is also influenced, um, you know, the information ecosystem and contributed also to the disorder that we see through disinformation. And uh, I think one of the aspects I would highlight is that, um, you know, uh, media polarization is also contributed um, to the disinformation because, um, you know, sometimes you'd find that some reporting has not been properly fed checked and verified as a result of the existing bias. And also, again, with social media, we've seen that mainstream media is also now competing with online media, competing with bloggers, competing even with uh, ordinary citizens and, 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 you know, social media influencers in breaking the news. And in so doing, you'd find that um, uh, professional standards are being undermined or they are not being adhered to. Um, and as a result, mainstream media has also been releasing information or disseminating information that has not been properly verified, that has not been fact-checked. And I think the danger also in that is that mainstream media is regarded also as reliable sources of information. So if mainstream media were to release information that is untrue or that is not factual, that also has implications um, in terms of their audience that relies on them um, to access information and make informed decisions especially during election season. Well, thank you so much for that. You bring in a very interesting aspect, fact-checking. Nerima, now that mm -hmm. you've been on the ground, okay, is it direct translation, ground? Okay. Yes. You've been <laughs> with the people in the ground. Yeah. Um, what initiatives are there when it comes to the issue of fact-checking? Because we know the issue of misinformation is people don't fact-check, mm -hmm. especially on social media. It's such a fertile ground for misinformation and disinformation. But the mistakes we do is we don't fact-check. What, um, what initiatives are there to um, train people or teach people on the issue of uh, fact-checking? 
So we recognized that a lot of people were discussing issues which majorly are false, either in their WhatsApp groups or on Facebook groups online, especially during elections. There are some groups that become super, super active uh, where people are especially grouped according to like a constituency and they basically share why they are following a particular political leader or political alignment. So what we did do is identify young people who have an influence in some of these spaces. So it could be student leaders from community leaders and basically call them for a training. And so we worked in about seven counties and the seven counties were mapped according to the way the government shared that these particular areas are areas of concern because of the tensions. So looking at even from Mombasa, Nakuru, Nairobi, and being able to map about 50 young leaders that we felt had online influence and training them on how to identify false information, the importance of fact checking, and also reporting some issues when they see it occurring in these groups that they're in. So they are already active. Uh, all we were doing was equipping them with things that they're able to utilize to be able to support community guidelines and to have have safer online engagement, especially create that environment for everybody else. What we did see is when some of them would say, no, that's not true. I've checked on this. I don't think that information is correct. They would often get attacked. They would often get attacked, especially from bloggers, say from the opposing side who were intentionally uh, sharing false information about a particular individual. So it was also hard for them uh, because they were saying, you know, here we are. We're trying to share that this is what the truth is, but we also have to recognize that during political seasons or election seasons, people tend to get really emotive. So sense goes out the window and they begin to fight about things that don't even make sense uh, because they're trying to defend an individual. So we found that it would be more important that these guys grouped together. So if someone says, negates a comment and says, that's false, I checked that, it's not true, they have at least four or five people joining on board with that particular message. So having these groups was important because people would flag and go into their WhatsApp group and say, hey, I just saw this message. If you could come, here's the link. Uh, come in and support me so that it doesn't look like one individual who's attacked by this army that is not willing or interested in fact checking. So those are some of the things that we did. And until to date, we still have some of our influencers still fact-checking information. Uh, they've carried this through and pushing for reporting some of these issues because sometimes you see something that shouldn't be online or something someone has said, and we don't take that extra step to report it. Uh, people don't go and click on the tabs. They, they don't. And so just encouraging people to take a further step than not just leaving it there or being quiet and scrolling through. Wow. Um, one of the things that uh, the Data Detox Kit talks about is uh, when it comes to misinformation is the importance of fact-checking. And Nerima, you bring in a very interesting point, fact-checking. But for you to be able to fact-check, you also there is the issue of media and uh, digital literacy. And especially now that you're working in the counties, uh, some of them uh, quite rural. Uh, Nompilo, I would just like to know the issue of media literacy. Um, how civil society actually can go about training people on the issue of media literacy because that is one of the things that really encourages misinformation because you get a message on WhatsApp, you forward it to the next, you know, without knowing the consequences, without asking yourselves questions. Yeah, thank you very much for that. I mean, I, I, I do agree that civil society plays um, a critical role also, you know, in promoting information verification. And, and I mean, it's great to listen to Nerima and learn about what they were doing, particularly during the Kenyan election. Uh, but I want to say that, you know, um, Actually, this gap is there across the region. It's not something that is in Kenya only. We have seen that in Zimbabwe. It's there in other countries, Ethiopia, Uganda included, so many countries in the region where we have gaps in terms of digital literacy. Uh, but I want us to acknowledge also that there are other existing gaps which also limit the capacity of civil society to undertake digital literacy. Uh, one being internet penetration. Uh, when we introduce digital literacy, we are making a presumption that the people that we want to engage with digital literacy skills 
are people that are online, are people that are, can afford data, are people also that have smart devices. Because in order to be able to verify information, particularly on the internet, you also need to have a device that enables you to do that. So I think that is where most of the gaps have been. But civil society um, has been trying across the region. We have so many actors in the digital rights space who have been uh, leading some work in advocating for you know, increased um, internet access and affordability. We also have many interventions that have been focusing on providing tools, uh, particularly in rural and marginalized communities. You know, for example, um, even reverse image search, for example. So sometimes, at least for people that are online and that are able to verify, uh, there have been so many tools that has been cascaded down. Um, uh, there's one tool that I know also just called the Digital Inquirer Toolkit. Um, so several toolkits have been developed to enable, um, you know, citizens to be able to verify information. You find that also there are so many stakeholders that are um, undertaking interventions on media and information literacy. We have seen that, for example, in Namibia, where there's an organization already um, called Mili that focuses entirely on uh, media and information literacy. So it's there are lots of interventions that are there to ensure that you know citizens, one, are able to verify the source, to say when you receive information, check uh, what source of information that is, but also be able to check even on existing media, including mainstream media, to say, well, this has been forwarded on WhatsApp. Is it also there in, in any other platforms? Mainstream media, what is mainstream media mm -hmm. uh, saying about this specific subject matter? Um, and also, I mean, just using technology, some have even moved um, at least to even use AI to be able to verify even videos and verify even images because we also have uh, some other advanced forms of disinformation that we are seeing through deep facts and voice cloning and the like. So um, indeed, there's been work that has been done, but I think technology is also running away from us and we all need to be keeping up and ensuring that we provide up-to-date technology and skills, uh, but also bridging the digital divide at the same time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nompilo. Um, uh, Nerima, uh, I was reading a very interesting blog post by CIPESA. I was reading it on their website. And I don't, uh, um, I don't know if you remember this uh, comment by one of the politicians who talked about uh, do not put uh, poli you don't put politics in your lungs, you know. <laughs> and the article was talking um, about how we have been, um, we've come to a point whereby we we want to normalize this hate because now we are saying don't feel it is the. Um, it's the same thing you are you're talking about when they fact check and they find out it's the truth. The influencers or the bloggers who've been hired want to come out and say it is it is a lie. Um, when you look at the Kenyan scene, when it comes to disinformation and misinformation, what role do you think politicians have played in it? And mm. I want you to be very raw. Uh, politicians, there are some individuals that shouldn't even have access to handles, to be honest, because of some of the things that they say. Uh, sometimes it concerns me because there are some politicians in our country with over 3 million followers mm -hmm. and the person handling their account is a 26-year-old student. And even if they were to maybe one night just emotively utilize that handle to say something, it can actually cause conflict. And, and that's the difference when we talk about access to the internet or even these platforms and freedom of expression. In the global South in Africa, it's a completely different scenario. And, and it's not far off because we've seen it in 2012, 2013 with South Sudan, someone basically saying information that was completely false um, on a social media platform and causing conflict. So for me, I think that politicians need to be held responsible and accountable because they are to be held at a higher regard. I, I think we just give them a slap on the wrist and it's something that just shouldn't go because if you remember, Cecilia, like um, during the last election in 2017, when Chris Msando was murdered, like a few weeks, days to the election, um, now a CS, I mean, we have a whole cabinet secretary of trade. He used his Facebook account to basically share false information about his location and who he was with. And he wasn't held accountable for what doing that. that and never apologized. He's cabinet secretary today. And so I think there are very many examples of politicians doing that. And we did do a study 
a siesta place on OGBV and we realize like online gender based violence exists and women bear the brunt of it. And we went to political parties and looked at their policy guidelines in terms of conduct. And when it comes to their online engagement on conduct, they're mute. They're, it's completely silent. They will talk about, yeah, physical harassment or verbal harassment. And you can't even see any form of repercussion. Some of them may be, they will be told to resign, but they really don't. But when it comes to online abuse, it's silent. So I think that um, civil society organizations need to start pushing with it within that front, because even when you look at political parties in Kenya, we have about 90 parties that exist right now. And, and even in that particular research, the parties that were safer or the ones that had uh, politicians that behaved better are the ones that are women-led. And those are only six in our country. So that goes to show you that leadership does matter, especially when it comes to character. Um, but we do need to put more around having politicians being held accountable for what they say on their platforms. And to add on that, uh, the National Cohesion, I NCIC, and NCIC. Uh, I think when it was um, when when it came on board, I was very very hopeful about it, but I think now I'm really having my reservation. As you said, you see some of the leaders, the things they tweet. You know, sometimes I have to ch double check, like, <laughs> could this be the account or you know, a parody? And, yes, you know, and then you wonder what what then are we saying to the rest of the society? Nompilo, um, now that you work for an international organization, what cross-border initiatives can there be, especially, as you said, this thing is a cross-border, it's not only a Kenyan situation, it's, it's happening all over. What cross-border initiatives can, can there be so that we can be able to combat this menace? Because if we go on the way we are going on, let me tell you something, democracy, especially in this continent, is, a, is going to be a scam. Okay, well, it's already a scam. It's going to be a bigger scam than it is right now. Uh, well, I mean, there are so many opportunities uh, for collaboration uh, across the region and across the countries, uh, but I think it will also depend on which stakeholders are doing what. Uh, I think from what we have seen from a civil society perspective, which is also the stakeholder that I represent in the media, we have already seen some, you know, uh, information sharing. Uh, you know, just yesterday we were having a, a dialogue, you know, with Sipesa and Bettelsman Stiftung on Disinformation Africa, and we did, you know, uh, speak about how there's so many coalitions that has been that have been set up to address disinformation. For example, with the Africa Fact Checking Coalition, which Code for Africa has been leading. So we we have people that are coming together, you know, towards networking and collaboration to address um, disinformation. We have also seen, um, I, I mean, we've also seen research research uh, being spearheaded also to inform, you know, um, citizens across the region in terms of what the disinformation patterns are uh, and also uh, how to be able to combat that. Uh, but I think maybe from a collaboration perspective of governments, uh, I mean, um, we, we did have also representatives from the uh, National Cohesion and Integration Commission uh, at the dialogue. And uh, I, I did think also that it's an intervention that should be um, translated to the other countries. Uh, for example, in Zimbabwe, there is a National Peace and Reconciliation Commission, but I'll tell you, I've not seen them undertaking any work that involves online harms like disinformation and head speech and the likes. So I think we, we need to also start creating an opportunity for information sharing amongst government stakeholders and their responsibilities and roles in with regards to combating disinformation. But again, you know, disinformation is being spread through platforms and these platforms are international in nature, these are, uh, you know, multilateral companies. Um, so I think there's an opportunity there also to start ensuring that, um, you know, um, the, the platforms also allocate uh, enough resources to be addressing disinformation, not only in the global north, but also in the global south. Thank you so much. Uh, and you, you bring in uh, my next question, platforms which is a fertile ground for all this misinformation and disinformation. And we know there's a lot of conversation that has been happening. I know in Kenya during the elections, they've been doing a lot of um, like maybe civil education or something like that. But how can we also make them accountable 
because the, the, the vehicle that is driving this thing. So how can we make them accountable knowing like all the platforms are not based in Africa. You know, their, their offices are in the global majority, no, in the global, in the global North. Well, how can we make them accountable? Because it's like this big giant, which we cannot even try to poke. How can we make them accountable? I think there's a major case that's happening in the country right now um, against Meta yes. uh, with content moderators. I think we need to mobilize behind that because content moderators are the ones that keep our platform safe, technically, because they're the ones who are able to read through some of the stuff that goes up online and they're also able to flag it soon enough but then when it comes to our countries they normally hire very few of them um, our countries alone have hundreds of languages but you'll find content moderators are minimal and just focusing on major languages yet we know when it comes to hate speech or speech that is malignant you will find that people won't say it in english or in a major language they will use their mother tongue for specific words. So I think that's one area because we're seeing a lot of big tech companies are taking advantage uh, of the global south. So they are under hiring and then they are overworking and then they are underpaying. And it's just not a good balance. There's no way we're going to be able to have safe platforms if the people who keep the platforms safe are just not there. Uh, and that's the next frontier. So this is where they can be held accountable. And it's big cases like this. The first time it's being had in Africa that we're seeing individuals even from South Africa being part of the case in Nigeria as well. So it's a combination of African countries. What I would like to see is our governments also having a say because governments are out here making agreements and saying we need employment for our youth. Our particular government, the administration, is pushing for digitizing everything. Our president made a promise of having 25,000 hotspots in the country. However, there are no promises when it comes to protecting young people, when it comes to the protection of work. And this is the future of work. So major companies are going to have to listen, but we do need the goodwill of the government. And it's also the support with the civil society organizations to push this. Thank you so much, Nerima. Uh, also, I would like to talk about the 25,000 hotspot. We are so eager to make internet available for everyone, which is a very, very good thing. But are we eager to make them cyber resilient? You know, are we teaching them about safety online? Are we teaching them about things which come with this uh, platform that we have provided? And going back to the data detox kit, is about your safety online. How can you be safe? And not only you, how can you be able to protect the other person? So Nompilo, I also want to hear your view on the issue of content moderation, knowing that uh, in Zim you have the Shona, like also you find that people, it's not like everyone who speaks English. What is your um, view on content moderation? Because also there's a very thin line be between uh, content moderation and freedom of expression. Yes, yeah, I would meant actually to, to zone in on that. But I mean, firstly, to agree with Nerima in terms of the need for a multi-stakeholder approach. So I definitely think that all stakeholders should be working together with the platforms to address the gaps around content moderation and language, um, but also digital safety. Um, but also I've realized that, you know, uh, especially across civil society, there are concerns that, um, you know, platforms are not coming to the table. They are not engaging. So definitely we need platforms on the table to be engaging with civil society society uh, to be learning from uh, safe society's research and findings in terms of uh, what is happening on the ground and how we can address um, you know, disinformation. But now to come back to the issue of striking a balance between content moderation and free expression, I think we have seen uh, such challenges also because like what Nerima was saying, uh, you find that there are very few, uh, particularly human resource that is being invested in the region. And we see um, mostly also AI uh, generated content moderation. And as a result, out, we have seen cases where genuine expression uh, is also being undermined. You find that some um, posts and tweets mm -hmm. and messages that are actually not violating any um, of the uh, community guidelines or the policies, you find them uh, being taken down. You find some accounts even uh, being sus 
suspended and even being taken down. Um, so definitely, I think we need platforms not only to upscale uh, in terms of um, human resource and the context in the region and the language limitations in the region, but also to ensure that they take a multi-stakeholder and human rights and human-centric approach. I like that human rights, uh, human rights approach. Okay, well, let's come to the issue of cyber laws. Everywhere, especially in Africa, the law is yet to catch up with technology. Nerima, I just want to hear your views, especially on the Computer Misuse Act, uh, talking about hate speech and all that, because we've seen it happening online. We have not seen enough cases, mm. you know, or even people reporting on this issue and getting the justice that they need. Well, unfortunately, the cases that are normally highlighted are the ones that involve politicians. Yeah. And we've seen even this year a governor taking a blogger to court uh, because of him sharing false information. But we don't really see cases when it comes to people who actually instigate violence from their posts. And we haven't seen actual politicians being held accountable for things that they have posted. So for me, I think there's a biasness with the case at the moment where individuals who are in power are able to influence whether an individual can get arrested for what they have posted, which not necessarily is harmful to the public, but harmful to our politicians' image. And that's what I see the most. And the most epic battles that we have seen is with Boniface Mwangi and particular the politicians. People's watchman, yeah. The people's <laughs> watchman. He's the one who gets a lot of cases at his doorstep. And mm. again, it involves politicians. So I think there's still a lot of loopholes. And this is something that, you know, we need to highlight if we were to do even a matrix in terms of the number of cases that have made it to court on the basis of this particular law and what those cases entail and the result of them, then we will see that there is an imbalance. And I think that it's about time that we did a review because this this uh, law has been there since 2018. So are we able to come back and sit down and say, is it beneficial to the ordinary citizen or not? Is it actually protecting them or not? I think that's what we need to do in regard to this particular case. Uh, thank you, Nerima. Nampula would also want to hear your view, especially uh, give us a little background about the law in Zim when it comes to the issue of such uh, issues like um, uh, misinformation and disinformation. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I want to highlight that, uh, like you said, Cecilia, we do have a trend across the region where our governments are introducing cyber laws. Um, the Zimbabwean one was introduced in December 2021, but we also had the Zambians that also introduced theirs. And I mean, the Zambian one is actually being challenged in court right now. Um, so many countries in Nigeria also, they are equally raising concerns with their cyber crime law. So what I want to highlight really is that um, what we have seen, though, through our cyber laws um, is a an attempt to undermine free expression under the guise of addressing disinformation. I'll, I'll let you know that like in Zimbabwe, we already have a constitutional court order where the court said criminalizing disinformation is an unjustifiable limitation to free expression. Um, but in Zimbabwe, what, then we, what we did then through the cyber law was to smuggle, smuggle back uh, that same provision which criminalizes um, disinformation. So it's, it's titled um, uh, transmitting false data messages and it's a criminal offense. I think the sentence is up to five years Yes. And I'm not, I'm not saying it's bad to regulate uh, disinformation, uh, but I think criminalization is not the way to go. But what we are seeing is cyber laws coming in and criminalizing that and in the end also criminalizing genuine expression. So taking it to Zimbabwe, we have seen so many journalists being arrested. Hope watching on is one of them uh, who was arrested on that same charge. Uh, we have seen politicians, particularly opposition political leaders in Zimbabwe, um, Job Scala being one of them, Zaima Heri being another, she was even convicted quite recently on that same uh, provision of publishing false data messages. But when you look at the actual facts and circumstances of the case, you'll see that it was an issue of genuine expression. So basically what I'm saying is that there seems to be this coordinated attempt in the region by our governments to use the laws to undermine free expression uh, while creating an impression that it's, it's a way of addressing uh, disinformation. And we, when you look at the actual provision of this 
Zimbabwean, or Zimbabwean one, it actually smuggled back criminal defamation, which is what Nerima was saying, that you say something about a politician uh, and then they think it undermines them or it, maybe it, un it, it um, undermines their reputation or affects their reputation and then they take you to court. Um, in legal, pure terms, that is just defamation. Mm -hmm. And it's not supposed to be a criminal offense. You can go to the civil court if you, have a prob if you think you have been defamed. So we are seeing also governments smuggling back criminal defamation and politicians using those laws um, you know, to prosecute genuine expression, journalists and bloggers included, uh, under the guise that we are curbing disinformation. So I think, yeah, that's what has been happening across board, really, in the region. I must say it's 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 extremely sad, but I'm just hoping that um, things will get better. I mean, we have to be prisoners of hope. Yeah. And Nerima, picking up from what Nopilo said, I just want you to talk about, you remember the story of bloggers for hire? Mm. 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 <laughs> That's when I knew we had gone so low as a country. Yeah. Yes, bloggers for hire, influencers for hire, and basically they were being hired for to spread misinformation and disinformation. Right, for as low as five dollars um, a day. Mm -hmm. um, but then also is the fact that the way they would shift. Uh, for me, I found it so fascinating in 2022 to just see um, a blogger on one side with another party with a different uh, political candidate, and then. Seven days later, they have moved to another political candidate because now they've been offered much more and they just shift so easily. And it was also fascinating that people knew, like you would see the posts and you know that one is for that candidate, that one is for that candidate, and that one has been paid by that candidate. So as soon as they would post, you'd see some people commenting and saying, oh, they've been paid today, so we're going to receive a lot of content today, uh, just joking about it. But I think that later on, it's going to be a very serious matter because anytime you read content, you're not quite sure uh, whether it's genuine, whether it's authentic. And of course, just because of the way the algorithms are done, you'll find yourself in a community of people who think like you without really realizing that you're in that community. And then that becomes truth. And so I think that's going to be very dangerous for our political engagement in the future. But Youth are looking for opportunities. So when they see that a politician is throwing away money uh, to be able to do a job from the comfort of your house or on campus, they'll do it. And I also know a lot of students who dropped out of school uh, right before the election because they were making so much more money uh, blogging for politicians than they were uh, working or looking for jobs and side hustles. So a lot of them were disappointed when the election ended because they were like, now what am I going to do? <laughs> and you know, Nerima, it's the same thing happening right now. You see them jumping from one party to the next. And I think I I'm always wondering... If you see someone behaving like that, why would you believe any content that they put outside there? That's what I say. We are the problem, not even them. We are the problem. And to my last question, then, how can citizens participate in, combative, in combating misinformation and disinformation in order to protect the integrity of democracy, the integrity of election? Because I think the buck stops with us. You know, we can blame the social media platforms. We can talk about the influencers. We can talk about the laws. But us, what is our role in this whole thing? And now that is to the both of you. Oh, I just... <laughs> so I like, okay, no, let me... Let me <laughs> to jump on. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean... Uh, we are the consumers of news. As the, as the citizens, as the people, we are the consumers of news. We are the consumers of information. So, yeah, you, like you rightly said, Cecilia, the buck stops with us, mm -hmm. which is why I think it's important um, to acknowledge that uh, civil society and other stakeholders that are doing work in, in capacitating citizens and in media and information literacy are doing well. Um, so as a people, I think it's important that we verify information, especially before we share. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen even my parents, especially mm -hmm. my father you know he always shares these these messages and he says especially you people who travel a lot there's this happening where and you just get all this 
uh, false information and he just forwards it. So I think as a people, it's important, especially in WhatsApp groups, because I mean, uh, WhatsApp is there's end-to-end -end encryption, and unless if you are in, unless if you are in a group, you might not even know that there's this false information going around on WhatsApp, unlike other public platforms where you can see the tweets and the posts. So I think as a people, we need to be very resilient in terms of information sharing. We need to make sure that before we we forward any information, we verify. But also, I think um, it's important that uh, as a people, uh, we also particularly improve public trust in the media. Well, I think we need uh, mm -hmm. governments to be more open to providing information and facilitating public trust in the media because um, <coughs> you, I think the citizens have lost um, trust in the governments and in the mainstream media. So we need to, to ensure that uh, as a people, we also work together to reignite that public trust in the media um, so that you know we can rely on authentic sources. Um, but I mean, where we are going in the digital age, it's, it's very difficult really to, to be able to, to be on top of the situation as far as the, as the information ecosystem is concerned. But I think from an individual perspective, really, we can just try to minimize the spread of disinformation you know, by asking key questions, uh, who, where, why, um, and also just you know, ensuring that when we forward, we are truly sure that it's authentic information. Yeah. Thank right. you so much, Nopilo. Nerima? Absolutely. I agree with Nompilo 100%. And also you find, especially with young people, the people that they follow, um, they follow them like they believe them more than they believe anything else. And that's dangerous because you're also not sure where they're getting their information from. So I would say also find your own time and your own space to do your own research as well. And just making sure that you're finding information from different sources and from different places, uh, not necessarily from just one uh, particular celebrity or blogger um, that you follow is going to be important. Yeah, and I'd meant to jump in and say if something is trending, it doesn't mean it's true. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, now we've seen like oh if it's Lord. trending, 80% is a lie. I think about myself. I'm like, what? And then what you, is that? You, you ask yourself, is, is it me? <laughs> like you even start doubting yourself and you know it's a lie, but because you're like, oh, it could be me. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you so much, uh, ladies, for creating time to talk about this very, very important issue. As I said, I feel like it's getting worse and worse by day and we need to find mechanism to be able to act on it before it kills our democratic processes like across the region and the data detox kits uh, really emphasizes on the issue of fact, che fact checking always fact checked and both of them they've talked about fact checking you know it's so easy and um, i don't know whatsapp is like the hub of misinformation and disinformation because we are so excited to forward it to this group which has so many people always before you do that fact check because the damage that it does is so much you have no idea. So thank you so much for joining us on this exciting episode, which has been made possible by Tactical Tech through their Data Detox Kit. See you in the next episode.